just need to make sure I get this thing at about the right distance from my mouth because I'm not good with technology because I'm the kind of person who grows up to be a professional loot player. <laughs> you know, uh, the aptitudes that suit one for that line of work don't include buttons and knowing what a preamp is. You know, I still have no idea. I've been fed through them many, many times and so often the sound guy will come to me and say a lot of things to ask if they're okay. You know, and I'll say, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you just run that through your pre-amp. Do, do you have a, a woofer? You know, because you want to sound smart. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm going to start a whole minute early uh, so that I can talk longer, because that's a thing I do is talk for a long time. My name is John Lenty, and I will be playing for you tonight the Theorbo and the Baroque guitar. Um, this program is one that I'm quite excited about. It's unusual for us, just a quick show of hands. Is there anybody here for a moment? This is the first uh, Baroque Music Montana concert that you're attending. Okay, for, so for those of you who haven't been here before, welcome. I'm delighted you decided to take a chance on a concert of some unusual music that you are unlikely to hear anywhere else in the Rocky Mountain West. Um, uh, for those of you who are new to our way of doing things here, we are called Baroque Music Montana, and we are an early music ensemble and not-for-profit under the direction of Carrie Krauss, who will be playing the violin tonight. You're going to love her if you haven't heard her before. But uh, what we will be doing is playing, our, the, the, the instruments that we're playing tonight are uh, set up in a historical manner. The whole idea behind what we do is that we play old music on the instruments for which it was originally composed, and to the best of our ability, in a historically informed manner. So the way that music is performed has changed a great deal over time. The intrinsic value assigned to different aspects of what musicians do has also changed over time. There have been times when a great, big, beautiful, buttery sound was not nearly as important as a sound that approximated the human voice on your instrument. There have been times when the kind of sound that is made by a wonderful singer like Luciano Pavarotti would have been so utterly foreign that people would have said, is that, is that a human person or is that some kind of strange beast? You know, so we change a lot as, uh, as, you know, and music has been played in all of these different ways and one of the basic concepts that we operate on in our field is that when you say something differently, you say something different. So, by adopting this historical approach, by basing what we do in research and things like that, we hope to give you a unique take on this music that will somehow make some of it resonate with you in a more powerful and intimate way. So that's kind of at the heart of what we do. Now, as for the program that we'll be playing this evening, um, I'll just give you all a little bit of inside baseball. So here's how this goes. Coming up with concert programs can be sometimes the easiest thing in the world. Uh, there's actually a little bit about that in tonight's program. Uh, a lot of times what you do is you pick your five favorite things that you kind of know right now and you put them in a row and you know, get up on stage and you play them for y'all. And, and, and that's about all there is to it. You know, you can say, an evening of Baroque chamber music. But, for those of us that do this full time, it can be a lot more interesting to say, well, let's try and come up with a nice thematic link to put these things together. Many times it's a geographic or a uh, temporal link that puts these things together. So, you know, there's a lot of, I've given many, many programs that are music from the court of Queen Elizabeth I. You know, it was a great era in music, roughly the same era as Shakespeare in literature, it's a beautiful time, you can put together a real nice show, or you say, you know, okay, how about uh, music from Rome in the 18th century, music from the papal court. You can put together a real easy, nice program of Corelli and Handel, you know, composers who everybody loves, you pick at random, it's dynamite. 
Now, here's how this program came about, because this one is for, I, I designed this program, and for me this was a very unusual project, and one that was particularly gratifying to be involved with, but it had a funny genesis. So, a dear soprano friend of mine, who is now mostly a computer programmer, um, and won't be singing with us tonight, she and I booked the gig uh, six years ago, and it was to do a program of music from the golden age of English lute song, which is the end of the reign of Queen Elizabeth, the beginning of the reign of James I, all right? So, you know, pretty much exactly the, uh, the, the lifetime of Shakespeare. And we booked this gig in Tucson, Arizona, and we were both really excited about it, but it was a long ways off. We figured we'd choose the songs about six months in advance, try and get together three days in advance, put together the show. But then, about eight months before the concert, we get a call from the presenter, who's a person that was personally known to both of us, who said, oh my gosh, you guys, I'm so sorry. We can't do an Elizabethan lute song recital during that time. And, you know, it had taken us a long time to work out the date, you know. Um, we can't do this gig then because that's the Leonard Bernstein centennial year. <laughs> and this festival is happening in Tucson at the same time to celebrate the Leonard Bernstein centennial, so we won't be able to get an audience. Plus, we're supposed to co-produce something with the Leonard Bernstein festival. And I was like, here's, here's another thing. Is I'm a freelance musician. I am not a person of extravagant means. <laughs> when I'm fixing to lose a gig, I go into kind of a frenzy. My brain clicks into high gear, and all kind of weird stuff starts coming out of it. So, I read the email that says, you guys, I'm so sorry. And I said, not today, Satan. <laughs> no way, no how. And I thought for probably about 15 seconds and wrote back, how about if we do a program having something to do with Candide and Voltaire and Leonard Bernstein encountering this work of literature and deciding to write an opera about it? I didn't really know who Voltaire was. I didn't really know what Candide was about. Like, I'd seen the opera, but you know, opera's not a great way to tell a story. You know, you go to it and you experience it and you're there and it's real fun and, and all that stuff. But a lot of times the plot kind of, yeah. you know, it's, it's opera, right? You know, it's a, it's a whole experience more than it is like a narrative device. And, um, and they said, Sure, here's a few thousand dollars to hire some singers with. And then I went, oh my gosh. Because all of a sudden I had a deadline and I had engaged myself as a professional writer. Um, now, here's another thing to know about me. I left regular school at age 14 and did nothing but music after that. I, I do have a college degree. I have a high school diploma and a college degree and a graduate degree. But I'm not a very well-educated person. I did not do well in school. I did not, you know, like that, that's just not where I'm at. You know, I grew up to be a guitar picker and I like to read books. And that's about, that's, that's all I really have going on. So I'm not a writer <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination, but all of a sudden I had to become one. So I wrote a script. Then I learned how long it takes to read like a page of text, it takes a shockingly long time. So my first draft of this concert would have lasted about six hours. <laughs> and I also got on the computer and made arrangements of a whole bunch of music because we only had enough money for two singers, Viola da Gamba and me, right? <laughs> and so I arranged a bunch of music from Bernstein's Candide for this little ensemble. Then I got a note from the festival that said, in spite of the fact that this is a Bernstein festival, and in spite of the fact that at one point, Leonard Bernstein's daughter was actually engaged to be the narrator of this program, I wasn't allowed to use any of Bernstein's music because of licensing issues. <laughs> so then I was like, I, I, I. So I get back to the drawing board and I look through 
I looked through Voltaire's biography to see, well, I wonder if Voltaire had anything to do with music. And it turns out that Voltaire was, I mean, he was a great source of operatic storylines because Voltaire was, in his own time, the most successful playwright in the world. Maybe the most sex, uh, successful playwright of all time. But he was not an opera librettist all that much. The, you know, the libretto is the book of the opera that's, you know, because, the, you know, Mozart didn't write the words. He only writes the tunes, yeah? Same thing is true of the greatest opera composer of Voltaire's lifetime, who was a guy called uh, Rameau. Now, Voltaire and Rameau collaborated three times. Uh, two of them were successful, and one of them was scuttled by the church. Uh, they wrote two operas together, and uh, Voltaire was miserable. He hated the experience because, you know, like, here he is, he's Voltaire, he's got kind of a way with words, you know, and here's this composer who's, you know, the greatest living composer who says, oh, that just won't do, it's just not musical. And, you know, like, it, it, it's, it's like two guys who are a little too good at both their jobs, trying to do something together, it's just not going to turn out all that well. But from the couple of operas that they managed to write, I managed to find music that was thematically appropriate to the program that we have. So for instance, the first piece by Rameau that you're going to hear is this, this song, O More, the prison song. Uh, I stick that into the program at the point where I'm talking about how Voltaire was in jail once in a while. <laughs> now, for those of you who aren't familiar with Voltaire in general, um, I, in the course of designing this program, just fell madly in love with the man. Like, I was aware of Candide again, you know, didn't really know who Voltaire was or what he had done. And so encountering him uh, as a relatively mature person was a very good thing for me. Um, he was a deeply, deeply irreligious man. He was the greatest figure of the Enlightenment in many ways, and he is often spoken of right alongside the other great figure of the Enlightenment, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. But the two of them did not get along. Um, there's a thing about Rousseau, you can like or not like his ideas, I'm not a big fan personally, but he was scrupulously honest. He insisted on publishing everything under his own name. And for that reason, he spent most of his life in exile in Switzerland. Whereas Voltaire lied and lied and dissembled and lied and published his stuff under something like 240 different pseudonyms. It still got back to him many times and he was on the run for most of his life, but he wrote some absolutely hilarious letters denouncing his own stuff. You know, like he, he'd send a manuscript into his editor through an intermediary, and then the editor would say, Voltaire, this is by you, isn't it? And he would say, I am shocked, shocked. I just came back from taking communion, and I get this letter full of these calumnies suggesting that I might have written this. Actually, it was by Larry, and you know, like, Larry is, you know, an enemy of Voltaire's who's been dead for a while. If I thought for one moment that people even suspected that I might have written this, I would just die of shame. I had a copy of it myself, and I flung it into the fire, because I simply can't abide material that debases our beloved church or monarch in any way whatsoever. And this is from a guy who spent almost his entire career criticizing the Catholic Church, criticizing the monarchy, criticizing anybody in any position of authority who he ever had any dealings with. Absolutely beautiful stuff. Um, now, he lived a very long life. And in our program today, we have to tell you an awful lot of stuff, but we don't have all that much time to do it because the most important thing is for you to hear as much beautiful music as we can get you, get you through, right? You know, like, that's really what we're about here. So there are a few things that I had to leave out of Voltaire's life. Um, among other things, the, we do talk about it, but sort of at the core of Voltaire's 
story for me is his love affair with Gabriel Amélie Le Tonnelier de Bertuis, the Marquise du Châtelet. Uh, this was the great love of his life, and she is one of the most fascinating people who ever lived, and I spend criminally little time talking about her in this program. So, uh, I can recommend to you a novel, some of you I think already know this, uh, called Volt or not a novel, a, uh, a, a book called Voltaire in Love by Nancy Mitford, which is a beautiful story of Voltaire and his love affair with Gabriel Amélie, who he, he called Amélie du Châtelet. Um, apparently he's the only person who has ever called her that, that was personally associated with her. Because uh, Nancy Mitford is a wonderful author. If you know the book uh, Love in a Cold Climate or The Gift, they're these beautiful, uh, beautiful, hilarious novels. And as a popular historian, she is no less gossipy and wonderful. Uh, she, she worked mostly in the sort of in the general vicinity of World War II. And when she was writing her book about Voltaire and Amélie, she was talking to the descendants of Amélie, who were all still mildly scandalized that she'd had this affair with Voltaire. And uh, so Amélie was the most intelligent person in France. She was the only person who was smarter than Voltaire. Uh, she was the first French person to understand the work of Isaac Newton. Her translation of the Principia from Latin into French is the standard translation of Newton into French. Uh, I really wasn't smart enough to understand this, but at a certain point I read that she was probably the inventor of the financial derivative. So if you remember Hillary Clinton getting in trouble about pork belly futures back in the 90s, Amélie de Châtelet had something to do with that. I don't, you know, I mean, that, that's the kind of thing that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Um, and also she was the first person to theorize infrared radiation in a funny little contest that she and Voltaire took part in when they were, you know, just sort of like a happy little item, a happy little adulterous item. It's an incredibly French story. But, you know, there they are. They're a happy little item. Uh, the Marquis, that's Amélie's husband, was perfectly fine with all this. He was off fighting wars and things, and, you know, everybody's sophisticated and cool, you know. And uh, they, they took part in a funny little contest having something to do with the nature of fire. And she theorized infrared radiation before anybody else had even thought of such a thing existing. Um, so I spend criminally little time talking about her. And then there's another... A uh, very important aspect of Voltaire's life that I had to ignore because it didn't really fit into the story, which is um, his, uh, his later days. I only get to say a single sentence. Um, now, Voltaire, as a young man, uh, before most of the events described in our program today, rigged the Paris lottery with some of his friends, and ever after, he was rich. He was the most successful playwright of all time, but his plays really didn't make him any money. That wasn't a way to make money. Um, but he was a very good investor. Now, he has all of these adventures. He gets exiled, he goes to prison, he falls in love, he gets exiled again, he goes to the court of Frederick the Great in Prussia, and at the end of Act One of tonight's program, he'll be at Les Delices on the outskirts of Geneva. Now Geneva, at the time, uh, in, at this point in the 18th century, was a Calvinist theocracy. Not a very fun place to be in an awful lot of ways. Uh, especially not a good place to be a Catholic. Now Voltaire was a very bad Catholic, but he was a Catholic. And he was also a playwright. And, you know, like, when you're living in a radical Calvinist theocracy, you just don't get to have any fun, right? This fun is deeply suspect. So there were no theaters for the world's greatest playwright to put on his plays in. So he moved just across the border to a little village called Fernay. And this is relatively late in his life. 
And at that point, he starts to use his rather extravagant means to build a society. He brings a bunch of persecuted Catholic uh, workers from Geneva over the border into France, sets up a watchmaking factory, sets up a silk weaving factory, sets up uh, uh, pottery studios, and builds a beautiful little worker's paradise. He builds houses which he sells to his workers, allowing them to own them free and clear, pays them far better than they were ever paid in Switzerland, and enriches himself still more in the process. Now, at the time that all this was happening, he was also engaged in a lot of court cases, um, the most notable of which was the case of a Huguenot merchant who had been accused of the murder of his son, who had converted to Catholicism. Uh, so, this Huguenot merchant was accused of the murder of his son. His son had almost certainly committed suicide, but the Huguenot merchant was tortured to death, and his uh, wife, or his widow, and his surviving children were deprived of all of their money, and they were made destitute, uh, because they were Protestant. And Voltaire managed to uh, get that overturned. Of course, he couldn't bring back the executed uh, wrongfully accused person, but he did ensure that his name was cleared and that his family was made whole again. And that was only the most famous of a number of cases of redressing uh, cases of religious persecution that Voltaire had encountered. And the first watches to roll off the, uh, to roll out of the, the shop that he opened in Fernay, he sent to the bishops and the priests, and the king, and the queen, and to everybody he had made angry to say, I just wanted you to know, I'm a businessman now. I've got this little town, I've got this little watch shop, I'm out of the satire game once and for all, don't you worry. Also, I rescued all of these Catholics who had been so brutally treated in, um, in Switzerland. So, you know, like, I'm, a, I'm off to Mass now. I'll be taking the communion four more times today, probably, before I go to bed. But uh, enjoy the watch, you know. It's, it's 1760 something. Watches are still really, really neat, you know? Really novel. And he was lying. <laughs> because he lied and lied and lied in order to be able to lie again the next day. Um, now, a few quotes from Voltaire that I find particularly touching. He said once, I have only said one prayer in all my life, and it was, O oh Lord, make my enemies ridiculous. <laughs> and the Lord obliged. <laughs> that one I really like. One that I find deeply poignant is um, a leader can be forgiven for missteps that he makes in times of crisis, but in times of peace he is guilty of all the good he does not do. John's always sat real well with him. <laughs> and then, perhaps most famously, and I've heard that it isn't true, but it's too good not to be. When Voltaire was on his deathbed, because eventually he did return to Paris, and it happened that that is where he died, even though he was, you know, kind of just on a gig, seeing the production of one of his plays and paying court to people. Um, but he took sick. He's on his deathbed. Some well-meaning acquaintances brought a priest to him to give the last rites against Voltaire's strenuous objections. And when the priest gets to the part where he says, you know, and do you renounce Satan and all his works? Voltaire said, I hardly think this is the time to be making any new enemies. <laughs> So uh, that's a little bit about Voltaire that I had to leave out of this program. But um, now uh, I have.
have just a couple more minutes. So for those of you who are new to the Baroque Music Montana fold, um, I have one of these. <laughs> Ever seen it before? Yeah, I mean, well, some of you I've seen before, and if you've seen me before, you've seen this before, because I never go anywhere without it. But for those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is the Theorbo, T-H-E-O-R-B-O, -E Theorbo. It is the largest member of the lute family. Like all lutes, it has this teardrop-shaped body, and like all lutes, it has this kind of bowl for a back. But the lutes that you're accustomed to seeing, probably, if you're accustomed to seeing lutes, they tend to stop here, and kind of bend back at an angle, yeah? But this is the Baroque instrument that was used in ensemble playing. It is a combined guitar and bass, if you want to think of it that way. I've got these seven short strings, they're played like a guitar, and then these seven long strings, they're played with just the thumb. So it's kind of like having a harp stuck onto your guitar. <laughs> now, when I need a guitar without a harp stuck onto it, I play this thing. This is a guitar. This particular guitar is a Baruch guitar, uh, but I'll do guitar -y sorts of things with it. You will recognize it in both form and function as guitar-like. And speaking of guitars, my wonderful colleague Sarah will be playing this thing, which looks a little bit like a cello and sounds a little bit like a cello, but is not a cello and is not even te terribly much related to the cello. It is called a viola da gamba, and it is more closely related to the guitar. That's the alarm that's going to tell me to shut up. Um, excuse me. So it's closely related to the guitar. But it is still played more or less like a cello and does a lot of cello sorts of things, but it can play chords like a guitar. So, very pretty. And then, uh, my wonderful colleague, Kerry Kraus, is playing on a violin. It looks like a violin, and it sounds like a violin, but it is a Baroque violin. There are some subtle differences in construction of the instrument, uh, but most notable are it's played with a much lighter bow than a modern symphonic violin, and its strings are made of gut instead of steel. Um, I think that's everything that you need to know. I'm sorry I didn't leave more time for questions and things, but I've got to do whatever weird ritualistic stuff people like me do before a concert uh, for a few minutes. But thank you all so much for being here early. Thanks for listening, and I'll look forward to sharing this music and this story with you presently.